Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst in Cape Cod. Today, we are going to engage a huge topic that is very much in the collective now with events in Afghanistan and many other events in other places around the world, and that is the topic of war. And we are going to try to consider this from a psychological perspective and also an archetypal perspective that there is something about war that is bigger than we are. We all decry it, and yet it is ubiquitous in human history. Uh, So with that, um, I, for one, am taking a deep breath, and let us begin. Yeah, I think we wanted to try to tackle this topic because the events in Afghanistan have been very much on our minds. I know they've been on mine. I'm thinking back to my experience in Bosnia. I lived and worked there in the 90s. I was working for a refugee assistance organization. I arrived in Bosnia in 1994 and lived there for two years. And I was aware upon going there that I felt really curious, confused about what had happened, what had happened there that neighbor began killing neighbor. And I thought, you know, maybe I'll be able to figure it out once I'm there. Maybe I can learn what happens, that the bonds that bring people together just dissolve in a way that they can go after each other and kill each other. And so I would make a point of asking everyone, how did this happen? (laughs) And I remember being at one meeting and there was a local staff person there. So she was either Bosnian or Croatian. She was probably one of our translators. And she had a shirt on that said, if war is the answer, the question must be pretty fucking stupid. And I thought, hmm, okay. (laughs) And as awful as that is, the other side of this archetypal force has a great quote by somebody named Anthony Lloyd, and it's just before his engagement in um, something in Bosnia, a battle, and he writes, there can be few instances in life that a man is lucky enough to feel so at one with his time and place. It would have been a good moment to die. I cannot apologize for enjoying it so. It was like falling in love again, a heady, sensual rush that I wished only to clasp unquestioningly. He was a war correspondent. You know, I think this points up just exactly what James Hillman said in a book entitled A Terrible Love of War. And that to me is incredibly sobering. 
So we're holding a particularly Jungian perspective, which I always appreciate, that no social psychological phenomena like war has a single side to it when we bring a psychological lens. That there is the horror of war, undoubtedly, the human suffering, uh, economic suffering. And there is also much to be said about the euphoric, complicated feeling that people report when they are in the constellated field of war. And we see this in the tremendously inspired writings coming out of the Greek and Roman empires, this exultation of war and a kind of spirit that possesses those who are in the midst of it. It is often after the fact, when the archetypal forces have dispersed and our humanity returns to us, that we are confronted with the destruction and the ramifications of what has happened. And I'm going to jump in right there with a quote from Jung. Because, of course, Jung uh, lived in close proximity to both world wars. And here's what he says. To a quite terrifying degree, we are threatened by wars and revolutions, which are nothing other than psychic epidemics. At any moment, several million human beings may be smitten with a new madness, and then we shall have another world war or devastating revolution. So I think this goes to the point that you were making, Joseph, that we become gripped by something archetypal when we're in the constellated field of war. And it feels uh, deeply, can feel deeply meaningful. It can feel like we are a part of something larger. It can give our life meaning. Uh, we love war. There's that great quote in Hillman where he, he uh, quotes... Patton saying, you know, I love, I love this. Uh, I love war. Yeah. He says, I love it. God help me. I do love it. So I love it more than my life. And he said this as he was embracing a dying soldier on the field. So sitting here, we're horrified by it. And yet it is a constellated archetypal field, as Jung says. It is bigger than we are. William James was the first psychologist to investigate war, and he wrote an essay in 1910 called The Moral Equivalent of War. And in that, he suggests that warfare is so common because of, in his words, its positive psychological effects on the individual and on the society as a whole. And in his self-reflection, he claims that it delivers a sense of unity to a nation when they are facing a collective threat. He writes about it binding people together, and not just the army, but the entire community. And those of us who look back in World War II, for instance, the tremendous communal effort for people to grow food, for uh, women, for instance, to leave the home and enter into uh, factory jobs on behalf of the war, people even surrendering certain coins because precious metals had become rare, that the entire community in certain wars will come together. And James writes about the discipline that is evoked in the entire community, this willingness to be focused and to sacrifice and to create communal goals. And this shows up in the entire idea of the war effort. He also mentions on an individual level that people talk about feeling alive, alert, awake. And a quote from James, it redeems life from flat degeneration. Now, this also reminds me a little bit of Kingsley's book, A Story Waiting to Pierce You. Kingsley had wrote uh, Catafalque, which was his commentary on Jung's work. Uh, 
but in a story waiting to pierce you, he has a thesis that Genghis Khan's sweep through the ancient world actually was a kind of purifying war that liberated the consciousness of the ancient world from a degenerate, dying social context and made the way for a kind of renewal. And at the same time, Genghis Khan was mercilessly dangerous and brutal. Yes, yeah, so I think you're getting at this archetypal idea there that destruction has its place. And we see this particularly in the Hindu pantheon, for example, where some of the gods have as part of their attributes that they are the destroyers. I mean, Kali has that, and uh, is it Vishnu? Uh, it's actually Shiva is the destroyer, and particularly the destroyer of illusions. Okay. So the, the necessity of destruction that uh, we, we often don't want to know about. But I, I think that this leans into even Freud's death instinct. Absolutely. I think um, Thanatos, as Freud termed it, is really the ultimate repressed, the death instinct, and that it's honored and it's served by war. And it's an apotropaic right. In other words, something that serves as a talisman and keeps something else at bay. Uh, and it keeps death at bay by offering it sacrificial victims. Uh, so the fallen are uh, sacrificed to the, the god of death. And we approach it as the not I, and yet these opposites of life and death are joined by confronting battle, death, up close and personal. And just as you said before, Joseph, of that sense of aliveness and something sublime is something that people, warriors and veterans of the battlefield, report over and over again. And the sense of unity and camaraderie and altruism for the sake of one's unit and brothers in battle. And I think that some of this, uh, what we're lifting up, the, the sense of purpose, the sense of uh, being lifted up and, and given meaning and the sense of bonding and even euphoria, we can put that in this category of psychic epidemic that that Jung used, we can say that it's a kind of psychic infection to have this stirred up. In my uh, personal researches in Bosnia, where I would ask everyone, how did this happen? One person explained it to me. She was an American who had been there for some time. And this, remember, was in the mid 90s. And, you know, I, I said, you know, I don't get it. How did it happen? She said, well, she said, do you remember the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles? You know, and the troops were sent in to quell that and to quiet it down and to send people back home and to, you know, quiet the violence. She said, imagine what had happened if the troops had gone in and handed out guns to the different factions and encouraged it. And, and then I started to get it. And it's certainly the case that the internecine hatreds in the Balkans were purposely stirred up by uh, the leaders with uh, kind of fiery radio announcements about the evils of the other parties. And specifically, it was the Serbs who, who initiated it and stirred up uh, hatred against the the Croats and, and the Bosnians. And of course, it spread from there. I'm not letting anyone off the hook necessarily. Mm -hmm. But that we are susceptible to these kinds of psychic infections. We can be led into uh, seeing the other as the enemy. And Hillman talks about this. You can't have a war without an enemy. And so rhetoric and propaganda help us to dehumanize the other 
so that it feels like a just war. Yes. Uh, we have to be right, and they, whoever they are, are the bad people. Um, Hellman says that war is always latent in the human arena, emerging according to circumstances, and then as contagious as wildfire. And uh, picking up on your point, Lisa, about how people are stirred, well, I refer all of you to our uh, friends in the media, but here is a chilling quote from Goring, uh, one of the architects of uh, Hitler's terrible persecution of Jewish people. And he said at his trial in Nuremberg, the people can always be brought to do the bidding of the leaders. This is easy. All you have to do is tell them they are being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in every country. I think all of this is really uh, alarming and saddening that because war is latent in the human psyche, it is actually relatively easy to incite people. It reminds me of a, a story that a friend of mine told me. I used to travel down to Chattanooga, Tennessee regularly for work and had become friends with a fellow uh, down there. One afternoon, he recalled being in middle school, or maybe he was about 12 years old, and he and the kids in the neighborhood had begun to formulate a kind of war game just as something to pass the time, something they thought would be exciting. After about six months, the war game became so intense that my friend had told me he was convinced that they were in fact going to kill one of the other children. They were absolutely certain they were planning on it and it was part of the game. And he said, thank God that the parents in our neighborhood woke up to what was happening, stepped in and grabbed each of us and wrenched us out of this group that had formed. And I actually felt some kind of disbelief. I, I, I just couldn't even imagine this. And I said, are you sure? You know, like, are you exaggerating this? Or is this you know, something that's just gotten rescripted over time? Mm -hmm. And he goes, no, I'm, I'm really serious. I am absolutely serious that mm -hmm. had the adults not stepped in, you know, one of the kids in the neighborhood would have been killed. And I, I know there's recent research on this, but uh, the original data from the Stanford prison experiment in which students were recruited to do a role play of prisoners and guards also got reportedly very much out of control. And then there were the Milgram experiments in either the 1940s or 1950s, uh, which was a staged thing on the streets of New Haven, Connecticut, to help with research by administering a shock, which was fake and carried out by an actor, you know, for the, quote, greater good. And people could administer these fake shocks and the, the actor would writhe in pain and the experimenter would say, no, you need to do more, which illustrates the, the quote that I read from this man we all consider evil, that it's actually easy in the face of authority to incite people to violence. And Bosnia is a vivid example of that. Lisa, asking person after person, how did this happen? Uh, war is latent in the human psyche. And I think if we can start standing in that ground, if every listener, every human, could start standing in that ground, that the archetype of war is something that is woven into the bones of human beings, waiting to be activated, or conversely, waiting to be brought to consciousness so its influence can be properly mediated and perhaps canalized into other forms of change. 
I want to take a little bit of a turn, though, and go back and pick up what you were talking about a minute ago, Joseph, when you were talking about Kingsley's work, the purifying aspect of war, and I want to say the creativity that comes in the aftermath or even in the midst of destruction. We, we lifted up some archetypal parallels uh, that, that many mythologies address this exact idea that there must be a destruction in order for there to be renewal. Jung talked about the necessary of necessity of the tension of opposites, that this is how life proceeds. Life proceeds in pairs of opposites. And this is how consciousness occurs because we're, we find ourselves in the midst of the opposites. And while he's talking about this, he quotes Heraclitus, who said that war is the father of all things. Now, of course, Jung was using the term war there metaphorically, but I think it's still a valid point that it is in conflict that new things are born. And in order for new things to be born, according to Jung, and I think it's something we can all recognize, we have to be able to hold the tension of the opposites without going to one polarity or the other, but to hold that tension, allowing both sides that are logically irreconcilable, but in the unconscious can give birth to a new idea, to the third thing. But if we fall into this or that, one or the other, either or, the tension collapses. And so it's necessary to hold the opposites. And then something new can be born. And I think, interestingly, if we were to, in our conversation, just replace the word hold with war, (laughs) if we were to tolerate the war of the opposites inside of us and be able to observe it, be able to tolerate the heat, the contending of values, something could happen that is perhaps cleansing, clarifying. And even in conventional language, I know it in the consulting room, people came in all the time saying, there's a war going on inside of me. Should I stay? Should I go? Should I choose A or choose B? Should I become an accountant or an artist. (laughs) And when the polarities are intensely and vibrantly imagined, then all of a sudden it activates a thing inside of people. And there's a contending. And that sets up a kind of hierarchy. Just as you'd said, Deb, sometimes there can be an amalgam in a way that we could not have possibly imagined But sometimes the internal war allows us to discern what actually is the highest priority and what am I clinging to perhaps for neurotic or other reasons that don't really have a lot of footing when they're subjected to challenge. Yeah, and and Jung defined neurosis as the state of being at war with oneself. You know, I I think, Joseph... I I like your framing around that because what you're sort of saying is if we keep the war inside us, we maybe, hopefully, don't have to live it out there. And this echoes very much something that the Jungian analyst Eric Neumann spoke about in his important book, Depth Psychology and a New Ethic. And what he essentially says in that book is, you know, listen, (laughs) The nature of the game being played here has changed. We can no longer afford to split off our shadow and project it onto the enemy. And when we were talking a minute ago about creating an enemy, we really are talking about shadow projection. That is the mechanism through which we create an enemy, is we split off something in ourselves that we don't like or we don't want to know about, and we assume that it's out there that it's the other person who's doing it. And we do this interpersonally mm-hmm. and we do this on the collective level so that uh, the evil empire of the Soviet Union, for example, holds all the values which are in the shadow in the United States. 
and then we are justified in going to war. There was a an episode of Black Mirror that featured a kind of ongoing civil conflict, and the soldiers are implanted with a kind of chip. And when they go into a battle situation, they see that they are fighting a kind of monstrous, almost zombie-like, non-human creature so that they feel completely justified. They have no compunction about killing them. But when their chips are removed, as happens accidentally with one of the characters, what she realizes is she's actually killing people and the chip technology makes them look inhuman. Well, that's the mechanism of shadow projection. The chip is what happens when we project shadow onto another. We, We dehumanize them. So what both of you were saying about the necessity of holding the tension of the opposites and recognizing that it's an inner battle is perhaps crucial for the very continuation of Mm -hmm. the human race. Yeah. Many years ago, a friend of mine who was a Sufi was having a conversation with me, we were having tea, something like that. And as the conversation turned, he had said In the Quran, Muhammad says, there is the inner jihad and the outer jihad, and the inner one is the hardest. Mm -hmm. So there is this acknowledgement often in many of the religions in the world that the inner war, and in that context, I believe, it's the inner war between the ego and the self. Mm -hmm. That is the most excruciating thing, which also can be externalized. And I'm wondering if one of the ways that's externalized happens around religious wars, that wars that seem to be sanctioned by people's images of the self or their obedience to some image of deity. Many people justify any number of psychological or physical violences because it seems that their deity is encouraging it or even requiring it. And then we're in the realm of that amalgam between the parental complexes and the archetype of the self. And what does it mean to be obedient to this internal image? We are that takes me is into the realm of myth. How can we start to understand it? And I think the mythological substrate that is evident in mythologies from all around the world uh, helps us to understand the archetypal, superhuman, ubiquitous, and autonomous nature of war. Uh, which is what Hellman calls it. He calls it the autonomy of war. And in Greek mythology, uh, the war god was Mars or, or Ares. There are actually very few myths about him, but what I think is so interesting is he's always presented in an action. Uh, it's a force, not an actual developed person. We have more a uh, sense of the personality, if you will, of Zeus or Athena, who was the strategist. Even Ares' father, Zeus, didn't like him. And in the Iliad, Zeus says to him, you are most hateful to me of all the gods. Forever strife is dear to you and wars and slaughter. He inspired no affection. Uh, and usually uh, sites to honor him were placed outside the city walls because war and civilization, war and culture are such opposites. And Ares' two sons, Phobos and Dinos, uh, were his charioteers. Uh, Phobos is shock and fear. We get our word phobia from that. And Dinos is awe and monstrosity like what you were saying, Lisa, about Black Mirror, of we see the other as a monster. There's mythology all over the world about the god of war. Yeah, we, to prepare for this episode, we went to Wikipedia and looked up, you know, war gods or something. And there's an 
an entry in Wikipedia that lists them, and there were dozens and dozens of them. So I, I thought we'd pick out a few choice few, but honestly, there were so many. It really does underscore the reality of something you talked about a minute ago, Joseph, that this is really woven into our bones. It is archetypal. But just to visit another uh, war god in Celtic mythology, there is a goddess that's referred to as the Morrigan. And uh, she is sometimes considered to be a triple goddess, uh, three sisters, but sometimes she appears just as a single individual. And she's mostly associated with war and fate. She derives pleasure from mustard hosts. She often has premonitions of a warrior's violent death and could appear to a, a warrior in his visions or dreams, washing his clothes or armor, his bloody clothes or armor. And this was a premonition of his imminent death. She could influence the outcome of battle and could inspire fear in the enemy and courage uh, among, among her side. And sometimes she even joined the battle herself. And there are also many uh, war gods who are female, so war gods and goddesses. Athena was also yes. a goddess of war springing from Zeus's forehead, and I think that's a very important dimension, is that in American culture, I think we tend to associate war with the masculine or exclusively with men. But there is something universal about the archetype of war. The Amazons in Greek mythology were also fathered by Ares, this tribe of ferocious female warriors which inspires a really interesting response in the modern culture in the new Wonder Woman uh, series, which are marvelous. The chief character, the heroine, is said to be an Amazon. It's interesting that somehow being a kind of overwhelming warrior in a female body somehow seems more exciting um, and more empowering in some way. <laughs> I mean, more excited to the male viewers, perhaps. <laughs> Maybe, but uh, there's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. kind of feeling about uh, feminine power. That said, I think that our country has a very ambivalent relationship, not just with war, but with those who carry the spirit of war. Men in the military are often eroticized. They show up in all kinds of movies, as romantic figures, as superior men in various ways. Americans have an enormous, lusty love affair with movies that depict war and killing and with ever more specificity images of the war field. You know, when I was a kid, we went to see Star Wars. People who made Star Wars decided that despite the fact that guns were being fired or laser beams, that there would ne never be any actual blood on the set, let alone any other of the kind of battlefield gore. Well, if we look at any of the modern war movies, you know, we're seeing graphic depictions of people's heads being separated from their bodies or their torsos being split up and their entrails falling onto the ground. That the imagination of the collective is demanding more and more graphic depictions of war to satisfy something in the psyche. That is so incredibly sobering and saddening. Uh, and yet facing that reality, I think, is why we're doing the podcast today. Uh, we do have a terrible love of war. And of course, with uh, military and fighting men, and it usually is men still, of all the aesthetics, the uniforms, the parades, uh, the tanks, the airplanes flying overhead, the bands playing, flags waving, it is stirring 
to us. Well, Joseph, you mentioned the ambivalence that we have of people who carry war and the warrior spirit. And of course, uh, you know, it's true that men in uniform are seen as superior men and, and pictured in eroticized ways in movies. And at the same time, most of us remember the experience of Vietnam vets returning and how reviled they were and how, I mean, this is another case of, of sort of shadow projection and, and scapegoating because we don't like to admit to ourselves that we love war. Some, some of us don't like to admit that, that that's part of the human psyche. And so we can project that onto the veteran and view him as the evildoer, and we get to remain pure and don't have to admit that we have an inner warrior. There's an enormous distinction, and this shows up in some social science research around war. If the war is perceived as an act of offense, the warriors are perceived differently. If the war is conceived as an act of defense, the warriors are seen as superior and even laudable. As even as heroes. Right. And I have to say, I, I had a moment that was very powerful for me. 9-11 had happened. I'd seen it on television. It was a s shocking. I dissociated actually watching the TV. It was so overwhelming. And then it was many, many months later when air travel had been restored. And I was very, very anxious the first time I flew after that. I walked into the airport, and there was a soldier with a machine gun standing in the hallway. In fact, there were several of them. And as I was passing him and looked at him, my eyes welled up with gratitude, and I just walked over and I said, thank you. Hmm. It was so overwhelming to feel protected in this kind of defensive military position, and I was very sincerely appreciative. So that perception of defense versus offense has a huge effect on how we respond. And of course, that can be manipulated by politicians. Yes. What I wanted to, to just put into the conversation, maybe we have a, a few sentences about it. This is part of what's happening, I think, in Afghanistan. As America is withdrawing from Afghanistan, and the politicians and the media and everybody else on social media is talking and swimming around this event. It's very unclear in the collective whether we should see American influence as offensive or defensive. And because that polarity is now mutable, people are struggling to figure out what their stance is about American involvement in Afghanistan. And I find that fluidity very interesting, and you can see how disturbing it is to the collective to not have a stance yet. I wonder, too, I mean, if the stance has to do with perceived victory or defeat. And that with Vietnam, perhaps Iraq, and now Afghanistan, uh, that there was not a clear, quote, win, unquote, uh, for American troops. We were not successful. And the American collective, our national collective, is very much governed by practicality and action and effectiveness and uh, getting the job done. Uh, we're we're a very practical nation, and we're usually in a hurry, and we don't like things to be drawn out, and we certainly don't like any kind of perceived failure. Yeah, and I th I think in some way that leads into this other topic that I wanted to bring up, which is the way that being in the midst of war connects us with this archetypal force and is a kind of inflation. If to be a soldier on the battlefield, to be a general, to be in a life or death situation and be in a situation where you can cause the death of another or perhaps many thousands of others, it is a godlike kind of stance. 
Yeah. And I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, Oppenheimer's words that he spoke when he witnessed the detonation of a nuclear weapon. He said, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. So especially as technology improves, but I think that this has probably been true for centuries, being in the midst of war allies us with the gods and seemingly gives us godlike powers. I think that is incredibly powerful that we are inflated with the power to take life. One statistic that I came across that I found so striking is in the Battle of the Somme in World War I, 62,000 British soldiers died on the first day of the battle. And that uh, resonates and brings to life for me what you're saying about the inflation. It's bigger than what we can imagine. And there are people out there that have many, many more statistics. But that's what we're talking about is death in one day, 62,000 British soldiers. It's of mythological proportion. Yes. Exactly. And that brings me to uh, to something that I wanted to bring up today, which is this famous passage from the Bhagavad Gita, which brings the conversation, I want to say, into a, a higher octave, maybe. And I, I'm just going to read, this is um, Joseph Campbell's description of it, and then he actually quotes the Bhagavad Gita. So I, I want to just read it, if you'll indulge me. This vision was open to Arjuna on the battlefield, the moment just before the blast of the first trumpet calling to combat. With the god as his charioteer, the great prince had driven out into the field between the two battle-ready peoples. His own armies had been assembled against those of a usurping cousin, but now in the enemy ranks he beheld a multitude of men whom he knew and loved. His spirit failed him. Alas, he said to the divine charioteer, we are resolved to commit a great sin in that we are ready to slay our kinsmen to satisfy our greed for the pleasure of a kingdom. Far better would it be for me if the sons of Dhritarashtra, weapons in hand, should slay me in battle, unarmed and unresisting. I will not fight. But thereupon the comely god had summoned him to courage, pouring out to him the wisdom of the Lord, and in the end had opened him to this vision. The prince beholds, dumbfounded, not only his friend transformed into the living personification of the support of the universe, but the heroes of the two armies rushing on a wind into the deity's innumerable, terrible mouths. He exclaims in horror, when I look upon thy blazing form reaching to the skies and shining with many colors, when I see thee with thy mouth opened wide and thy great eyes glowing bright, my inmost soul trembles in fear and I find neither courage nor peace. O Vishnu, when I behold thy mouths striking terror with their tusks like time's all-consuming fire, I am disoriented and I find no peace. Be gracious, O Lord of the gods, O abode of the universe. All these sons of Dhritarashtra, together with the hosts of monarchs, and Bhishma, Drona, and Karna, and the warrior chiefs of our side as well, enter precipitately thy tusked and terrible mouths, frightful to behold. Some are seen caught between thy teeth, their heads crushed to powder. As the torrents of many rivers rush toward the ocean, so do the heroes of the mortal world rush into thy fiercely flaming mouths. As moths rush swiftly into a blazing fire to perish there, even so do these creatures swish, swiftly rush into thy mouths to their own destruction. Thou lickest thy lips, devouring all the worlds on every side with thy flaming mouths, Thy fiery rays fill the whole universe with their radiance and scorch it. O oh, Vishnu, tell me who thou art that wearest this frightful form, for I do not understand thy purpose. And then Vishnu says to him, I am mighty world-destroying time, 
now engaged here in slaying these men. Even without you, all these warriors standing arrayed in the opposing armies shall not live. Therefore, stand up and win glory. Conquer your enemies and enjoy an opulent kingdom. By me and none other have they already been slain. Be an instrument only. Be not distressed by fear. Fight and you shall conquer your foes in battle. And it's it's such a profound image that this this thing is going to happen anyway. And we are but instruments. I was reading that and thinking, Deb, about what it must have been like to be there at the Somme on that day when 62,000 British soldiers perished. It must have felt a lot like that description. But when we see things from the individual human level, it seems like a catastrophe beyond reckoning. When we see it from the mythological level, from the perspective of Vishnu, it's just another thing that happens. It's just life and destruction. And the God is in charge. And we must, you know, we are not immune to the forces of the gods. I also think it's very interesting to note that Krishna was an avatar of Vishnu. And Vishnu was the preserver Brahma was the creator, Vishnu the preserver, Shiva the destroyer. And so in the cosmology, the earth hangs on a thread between the forces of darkness and the forces of light. And at the end of the war, as the forces of light just barely hold on, just barely win, and Krishna is confronted for being so tricky and employing all manner of things to win this war. He says that I had come into the world to protect this tiny bit of light, and I did whatever was necessary. So this moves us into this very confusing place that you were mentioning before, that from the perspective of the self, there are meanings and depths of forces that are at play in any of the war-making processes in our soul, perhaps even in our families, certainly in the workplace, and much farther than that in the souls of nations, that historians often, even hundreds or many hundreds of years later, trying to analyze the factors that both created these conflicts and the impact on civilization may take eons for us to understand and evaluate properly. So the excruciating tension is imagining that incredibly objective, transcendent, archetypal dimension and still feel the horror the incredible, compassionate pain of what is happening to human beings and other forms of life, by the way, as this great wheel of time and civilization turns and crushes innumerable numbers of people underneath it. And, and it's not just in war that this is true, right? We, we always, as individuals are facing the great transpersonal forces that we cannot really fathom or comprehend. And, and somehow we do get crushed underfoot, and yet we somehow have to make our own meaning of it. I think about my friends, even right now, that are fighting a war with cancer. And it is a war. It is a full-out war. And... There are the fallen, and there are the heroes, and there is suffering, and there is spirit, and there is hope and despair, and all of the things that we also feel in the collective. There is such a microcosm, macrocosm dance that is going on between the larger 
and the smaller. I'd like to take a bit of a pivot to one side because one of the things that, Deb, you had mentioned earlier was Hillman's book, A Terrible Love of War. And we have been stewing in these images and archetypes of war. But Hillman brings up something which is a little jarring, is that Ares was the lover of Aphrodite, who is the goddess of love. And while two of their offspring were phobia, fear, and dread, but another one of their offspring was Eros, the god of love, and Enteros, the god of returned love, and Harmonia, the goddess of harmony, Nike, the goddess of victory. So the fact that Ares could father both of these terrifying forces, but also father the god of love, it's something to really reconcile with. Well, um, the Greek gods never appear just all by themselves. Um, they're, they're always interacting and making deals and so on. And uh, the the story of Ares or or Mars in Roman mythology and Aphrodite or Venus uh, is that they had an illicit love affair uh, because uh, Aphrodite was married to Hephaestus great craftsman who trapped his wife um, in the embrace of the war god. And wherever Mars is, so is Venus, Uh, that these two seeming opposites are, are forever appearing together. And I think we touched on that in the sense of the the camaraderie and the pageantry, the beauty, the love, the sense of community, purpose, uh, this certain love of war that binds us together um, in the face of a supposed common enemy. So I think there is the spirit of camaraderie, but I think that Hillman is also leaning into something that is a little more perhaps even shocking, which is that the passion of Mars, the sexuality of that kind of red passion, is an environment also where Eros thrives. That Hephaestus, her legal husband, was a kind of sulking, introverted, often withdrawn blacksmith. And while he married Aphrodite and she agreed to marry him, it was the aggression and passion of Mars that actually captured her imagination and made him a welcome partner in her bed. So the passion and fire of war and of Ares has a place next to love and combines with love to create any number of positive and perhaps ambivalent effects. In many of our podcasts, we talk about the role of aggression and how when aggression is subverted or repressed, which is another way of saying that Mars has been banished, there are a host of symptoms and inadequately activated psychic potentials. And when aggression is welcomed into the conscious life and canalized in service to the self, all kinds of creative changes often occur. And those changes initially may seem like acts of violence. I resigned from a job. Everybody's shocked. The office is in tumult. Somebody files for a divorce. No one was expecting it. The kids are all distraught. Everybody's blaming them for just blowing up everything, you know, that everybody expected of you. And if this is in service to the self, 10 years forward, the person will often look back and say, all of that was required. And if I could not find 
Aries, if I could not mm-hmm. find the war in me to cleanse my life, I would have just died. Christ says, I bring not peace, but a sword. That sometimes furthering the mission of the self does take a warlike energy. I think that's a great point that you're making, Joseph. And I'm going to take that back to what we said earlier about being able to hold the tension of the opposites. To have that conflict go on in oneself leads to a process of discernment rather than a reactive response of just you know, going to war or externalizing it, putting it out there instead of in here, which is, I think, the hallmark of how those internal battles and going to war can be in service to the self. So we have to honor the gods and goddesses of war. We have to make them conscious so they don't become social symptoms. Mm -hmm. And that means that we read about this mythology and fairy tales, that we think about the internal correlates. When is Mars or Aries absolutely what is needed? When is he an unwelcomed guest? When does he come as the lover that creates all kinds of fecund possibilities inside of us, And when is he a blight? But it's the consciousness and the welcoming of the gods that allows us to have some kind of a mediating influence. And human beings are designed to mediate the gods and nature. In many religions, actually, it is the task of human beings as points of consciousness, as Jung said, Mm -hmm. to stand with one foot in the divine world and one foot in the physical world and hold a kind of moral center. Because the gods, when we look at the mythology, are not terribly moral. They are a single note within the scale of notes, and they are consistently that same note. Human beings are much more varied than the gods are, and much more attuned to the physical consequences than the gods ever were. Mm -hmm. But we can only act as mediators by knowing these things and reflecting upon them. I would um, add to your so very well said peon to consciousness uh, how important imagination also is. As Hillman states and restates in his book, that we need to imagine the real, the truth of war, and to imagine our way into it philosophically, psychologically, and theologically. Stand in the conflict of its complexity, and then to link it back up with what you said earlier about shadow, Lisa, is allowing the enemy to enter and occupy whole areas of your soul to submit to be penetrated, but not possessed. And that's a quote from Hillman. How much can we imagine inside ourselves of shadow, of the opposites, of inner conflict? How much can we contain that in ourselves as a way, perhaps, of mitigating the external world enactments of brutality, death, maiming, disfigurement, rape? I think we have to be able to stretch into imagining. And with that, perhaps we will shift into a dream. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've 
enjoyed the book and so that feels really great the reviews on amazon have all been glowing and that's been really heartening it's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people i'm just uh so happy for you and it's such a lovely lovely book both deep and accessible about the inner journey around being a mother it's never been that's never been written about it hasn't been out there and that it's getting such an enthusiastic heartfelt reception that's wonderful yeah i would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on amazon because <laughs> although there are many wonderful ones there um more is always better so thanks in advance for that you've really incarnated something that was in the ethers that needed to be pulled down needed to be shaped in words and needed to be made accessible and the proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective <laughs> yes that speaks a lot to the timeliness of this yeah i think you're right to us the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed <laughs> it's having a life of its own which yeah. is just what we want And what is certainly, in my mind, a synchronicity, today's dream comes from a dreamer who is in a war-torn country, and uh, the dream does make reference to that, and this dream arrived in our inbox as we began to prepare this morning for today's episode. It's a female dreamer. She's 25 years old, and uh, she works for a food delivery courier, and is a musician. I had a dream me and my boyfriend adopted a child and were living in a rundown apartment full of darkness that resembled a studio we rehearsed in. We went to the balcony to watch missiles falling and exploding in the sky. My boyfriend was aloof to the situation. My first thought was, this must be very exciting for the child because it's like fireworks. Then I realized that it's actually really dangerous and life-threatening. So I grabbed the child and ran inside, leaving my boyfriend outside gazing at the sky. The room was pitch dark, and I could hear the voices of my mother and my brother talking about me. They were saying, how is the baby going to survive without a shell? Then I realized the kid has turned into a round egg in the palm of my hand, and the shell was dissolving like wet paper leaving a bubble of fragile liquid with a fetus inside. I knew that any sudden movement could burst the bubble and kill the baby, so I tried to be as gentle and careful as I could, and then I woke up. And she notes for context that she just started a new management job in a very corporate company, which is very new to her. She says, at the same time, there was a missile attack where I live, and we had no bomb shelter, so that was very scary. And she says, the main feelings in the dream were fear, fragility, and loneliness. And for extra uh, context, she notes that Hamas just launched a missile attack, and a bomb fell close to where I live. I was cut off guard with nowhere to hide, staring at the missiles exploding in the sky. The first thing that I find myself curious about is the adoption of the child. And so I'm trying to imagine my way into her psyche to try to create a psychological metaphor for what that might mean. Because we talk about inner children very frequently in our dreams, and we assign them various things. But for it to be someone else's child, which I then take in, and provide all of this for. I wonder what that means. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that too. And what I will say is that the word adopt comes from the Latin for to choose, to choose towards something. So there's one of the things, if you think about it symbolically, that's different between uh, like a pregnancy and ad an adoption is that adoption is very consciously chosen. Often pregnancy is too these days, but it, it can happen that you become pregnant completely unconsciously without meaning to, without knowing how or what, when it happened. But adoption is, is purely conscious. 
So there's been a conscious decision to take on this symbolic child. I think what the ambivalence is inside of me is that it always feels very rewarding on a purely psychological level when somebody gives birth to a child because it feels like some potential that is indigenous to the person has surfaced, is gestating, and is making its way into having a life in the outer world. When I think about someone else's potential being brought into the psyche and nurtured, then it brings up this question, again, purely on a symbolic level, is, is the thing she is protecting and nurturing as a creative idea, is it really hers? And if it isn't hers, who or what has populated her psyche and is causing her to take care of this enormously fragile potential, that leads me to wonder if she is carrying a potential for her boyfriend. I'm aware that there seems there there's a polarity here that at first she's outside and watching all the missiles and it's spectacular and it must be exciting for the child um, because it, it likes fireworks. So we start out with a child and the excitement or spectacle of these missile, missiles. And then it seems like there's a devolution of the child in the egg and then this very fragile fetus inside a very uh, fragile bubble. So I'm curious about how this child regresses to such a fetal stage in the face of the apartment full of darkness and the room being pitch dark. Well, you know, I think uh, just furthering a little bit about what you both said, Joseph, I think it's a really interesting question about is this content something someone has sort of saddled her with. But we oftentimes see in dreams people relating to a child that isn't necessarily their own. You know, you walk into a room and there's a baby and you pick it up. And I mean, that's a fairly common dream motif. And I think that it can signify what you're talking about, that really this is someone else's. But a lot of times, the child, I believe, can represent a new potential in ourselves that we can't claim as our own yet. We can't quite see it as belonging to us. And in some way, I think that relates to the point that you brought up, Deb, is that there's a kind of um, naivete in the beginning about the Mm -hmm. child there's uh, everything is sort of sugar coated. Uh, oh, look, you know, these, these this is going to be like fireworks. And then the reality of the incredible fragility of this new life really makes itself apparent. You know, Jung talks about the child archetype and that it is paradoxically both very powerful and also incredibly fragile and needs protection. And I see the dream in some sense as dawning consciousness on the dreamer's part about just how fragile and in need of protection this tender part of her is. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I wonder in terms of the role of the boyfriend, he seems to uh, be that part of the psyche that would like to turn a blind eye to the dangers and perhaps uh, sugarcoats them or I, he doesn't accurately see the situation because he's standing out on the balcony while the missiles are falling. Well, I'm uh, really sitting with what you've said, Lisa, about this, about a child and the initial situation of a kind of a little bit casual, a little bit overly innocent of w- w- this is spectacular. We'll just go outside and, and witness it. And that at the end, something um, much more heartfelt has come into the dream ego of that uh, with, with her mother and brother telling her her inner mother and brother, that how is the baby going to survive? And then realizing how incredibly fragile this is. And she says, I try to be as gentle and careful as I can. Mm 
So we've gone from the spectacle of standing on the balcony and as spectators to the realization of, of how powerful her gentleness and carefulness are going to have to be. Yeah, it's a little bit like, look, there's a war out there. You yeah. are going to have to protect this content. Yes. The fragility and the preciousness of new life, which is, you've said, and as Jung has said, represents often new potential in the psyche. It's also interesting that the child kind of turns into a fetus in an egg, mm -hmm. a round egg. I mean, that's an interesting image. We could work with it a lot of ways, but egg, a sphere, those are often images of the self, as is, you know, the, the image of the divine child is related to the self. And the world was born in some mythologies from the cosmic egg. Mm -hmm. It's a symbol of something with huge potential that's very, also very fragile. Absorbing all of the emotional tones that you guys have brought forward, I would want to put just a different lens. It's, it's unclear from the context whether or not the dreamer is actually partnered or whether this is just an inner boyfriend. But I'm just going to take a stab at the interpretation. So if the boyfriend is an actual person and she and her boyfriend in the dream have adopted the child, I'm wondering if this is also a process that's going on in that relationship, that she and the boyfriend have come together and have made a choice about engaging in a partnership. And what that brings forward, a kind of analytic third, is a child, a new potential, or even a childlike quality that occurs. At first, the childlike feeling of the relationship is enjoying the fireworks of the relationship. And that's a term we often use. We come together, there's all these fireworks, passion, different things. And then as the dream progresses, the fireworks actually begin to feel destructive and dangerous, that the passion in the relationship suddenly doesn't feel as safe or as exciting as it did in the beginning. Then there is a reconsideration as to whether or not the relationship can survive this deeper understanding of the passions and tensions in the relationship. And it ends, as both of you remarked, with this change of attitude that the relationship, perhaps, also needs very careful tending, that the relationship is much more vulnerable than she would have thought in the beginning, and that just a little too much tension or too much fireworks could actually cause an irreparable harm to the feeling of the relationship or some other quality. So if I were to place it just in her life as making a few assumptions, that's another way I would think about it. I'm going to just maybe extend my interpretation a little bit. I don't think I'm saying a whole lot new, but maybe just clarifying it. I feel a little bit differently about the figure of the boyfriend. And as you say, we don't know if there's a real boyfriend or not. But there, there are two main things that happen in this dream, and they're related to each other. They're, they complement each other. One is she goes from realizing that the baby, she goes from feeling that the baby is, you know, here, here just this baby, to realizing that it's this incredible, incredibly fragile fetus in this egg. The second thing that happens is she goes from feeling that these missiles are just entertaining fireworks to realizing, heck no, this is really dangerous and life-threatening. So again, the dream seems to be underscoring this dawning awareness and this idea of the kind of scales falling from her eyes about something, that something's really coming into focus, that there's, there's something real at stake here and it's really under threat. And I'm struck by the fact that the boyfriend is aloof from the situation and is just standing on the balcony watching. So whether the boyfriend is an actual boyfriend and there might be something about on the objective level about that relationship or whether he's an, an inner figure that I believe is aligned with the part of her psyche that wants to continue the denial about what's actually happening. So if I were to 
chart that out and put all four characters just in a little square on a paper. Mm-hmm. It was the mother, the brother, the boyfriend, and the ego. And the ego is connected to all three characters. The mother and brother are connected. But the boyfriend is aloof. If we think about this purely intrapsychically, the boyfriend doesn't have a relationship with the mother or the brother. So, again, if we think about it even as an anonymous figure, there's something, the aloofness could actually be the problem, even though it seems like a small part of the dream. But intrapsychically, having something that is not integrated into the system of the psyche can create an awful lot of tumult. And there could be some rising awareness that whatever he represents isn't working well if it stands out on the balcony while the bombs are going off, or is not is aloof to the care of the child, or is not attentive to the concerns of the mother or the brother, is a way in which he's very apart. Mm-hmm. And and the the dawning awareness happens kind of paradoxically in this darkness. And and there is a way that uh, sometimes new life occurs in darkness, the darkness of the womb. And also that, you know, the, the paradox that, that sometimes it's the blind who can see, you know, so somehow she has to come in and go into the darkness before things become clear. If we take just one more lens, which I think she's giving to us in her associations, is it a trauma dream? Yes. That, you know, she's there has been a, a legitimate, horrifying attack and missiles exploded near her. She's dreaming about missiles exploding and the the elements of the dream are trying to make sense of what has happened. In one part of the dream, it's like, oh, is this exciting? No, it's terrifying. How do we stay protected? Can anything be protected? Or is do I have to accept this excruciating feeling of vulnerability and fragility, which manifests at the end of the dream? And as you had said, both of you had said, the feeling of protectiveness towards that fragile part of her does seem to be a kind of medicinal stance, Mm -hmm. that she does need to really carefully tend how fragile she is feeling post this traumatic experience. And it's legitimate and real. Building on what you said about the dream characters, Joseph, of it. There are five of them, uh, the dream ego, the boyfriend, the brother, the mother, and the child. And I agree that there's a real trauma element here. With the dream ego, uh, trying to really integrate and unite all these various factions, uh, dream ego and boyfriend together are in a parental role as they adopt this child. Then there is the split with the boyfriend out on the balcony and the dream ego inside, the dream ego hearing the voices of mother and brother saying, how is the baby going to survive? So I'm feeling like the dream ego is in the middle of all these relationships of uh, the mother part, the brother part, the boyfriend part, the child part, and trying valiantly Uh, to bring them all together in order to nurture this new life. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.